It's the morning of January 21st, Saturday, 2017. I'm Dana, your host, nuclearproctologist.org. And we are live streaming today in order to tell you a story so it never fades from history. Because the legacy is your history. It's a history you might not even be familiar with. And that's okay. Not a big deal. Can't hold it against you. The world's pretty complicated. And first, we'd like to say hello, everybody. Out in the internet land, sometimes. Good morning, CJ, Elaine, Sean again, your moderator, Gold Wing. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to the world that is sitting out there wondering what the hell is going on. There's two of these guys and they're ganging up on the nuclear industry. Doesn't seem like a fear fight. Well, it's not a fear fight unless it's your loved ones that are in harm's way. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to tell a couple of stories. And then the first story is not going to be with that song or that one. That's what we had right coming up there. Let's try that for a kickoff. And so this story is really, 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 truly straightforward. We're sending in the homeless to this place uh, known as Fukushima. And behind me, that red depiction these are the fuel pools and this is the reactor core reactor core is where my finger is pointing the reactor cores are after they're used here in the center for 18 months they're put up there in these fuel pools i can probably make this a bit more presentable for everybody whatever with all the craziness all around the, the distraction and so what you're seeing is a fuel pool this is the top of the reactor top of the reactor this is a big yellow bulb right behind my head even though it's depicted as red now if you look over here this is the building that they're talking about it's you can see it's all missing so just to give you a good foundation, because this is an important video, we're going to take our time today. And at the same time, we're going to show you documentation from the coastline of British Columbia. We're out on Cape Scott. We're on the beach. Me and Zoe. And the boat is way over there. Probably can't see it. Slow tide, tide just, I think it just changed and starting to come up. Keep an eye on the zodiac, make sure it don't float away. And you can see the shore is naked. This is all underwater where we're stood up, like way underwater. It's a three foot low tide, so it's a really low tide. And we got some sea anemones. And we actually got some mussels, and we got some green sea anemones. The other 77 species are missing. The kelp, or the algaes is, or this is grass. And you can tell the grass is, you can tell the grass is dying. Definitely not healthy. Yeah, that's really bad <laughs> shape, by the way. This is, um, it's not healthy. Very important grass in a but very important area. Little mussels, that's unusual. 
it's unusual to find anything at all on the shoreline. And just to keep that in the comparisons, let me switch gears and come over here. Because what we're looking at, um, just give me a second to get acclimated. And what we're looking at, what you're looking at, let me do a better job of that in real time. So I'll try to give you an idea. So the arrows are representations of the coastline of Canada where we went and documented the species. And so you see Bull Harbor in the center of your screen. Then you would also see Cape Scott. And Cape Scott is where I'm to on the boat as you're watching that. And so let me make sure I get back here before we switch over again. Now, in that same spot, the whole shoreline should be very highly visible colors. These are before and after pictures. And you can see the colors and the life and the vegetation. So what you're looking at today is these expeditions. Um, along this coastline. And we're going to jump right back into it. We're out on Cape Scott. We're on the beach. Me and Zoe. And the boat is way over there. Probably can't see it. It's low tide. Tide just... Jump I ahead because we watched that. Some sea anemones. A little bit further. There we go. It's not healthy. But we do got some little mussels. That's unusual. And it's raining. <coughs> <laughs> And just make sure my zoom is working. Okay, my zoom is working. Let's keep going. Uh, looks like my zodiac is getting ready to float. We'll just keep doing a quick tour because in another hour, most of this will be underwater. But yeah, all the eel grass looks terrible, and everything here. I mean, there's some limpets, and that's a string of sea enemies you're seeing right there. Just like a walking tour, just in case. But 600 algaes are missing. 78 species of sea anemones are missing. Starfish are completely missing. The whelks, the periwinkles, and snails are, there's some here snails, but there's not many. And there's many varieties of these. And you can see the barnacles is tiny, tiny barnacles. Everything here is immature. Nothing here is an adult. There's no adults of anything here. And we had shot a little video in there on the shoreline of a school of fish. I'll play There's that probably in a bit. several thousand little baby fish. And some, like a codfish can have 700,000 babies. So one fish could have produced all those little babies and they're all the same species. So who knows? I'll play that. And the kelp. So there should be 700 algae here. You're looking at around five. Or the, the, the eel grass is dead. And not just algae should be there, obviously. Uh, but men, like all of these species to your left should be there. Everything to the left should be on that same spot. Yeah? That color, that diversity should all be sitting right there where I'm to right now, right? When I come ashore, I should see this kind of uh, colors. Excuse me, but I don't. So we're at Cape Scott, very top of Vancouver Island. And that's a, there's a big surge coming in. You can't really see it, I guess, on the videos. We'll come back here in a second. The wind is blowing offshore. It's 50 kilometers an hour, just a couple of miles away from me. We're tucked under the land here and anyway let's, we're let's come back over. Cape Scott we're oh, on the I beach that on the replay hang on okay 
So it should look like that. These are pictures I've taken. Now, the reason we're walking down this road, this is a disposition. Um, so let's start off with this radioactive fallout. Radiation from the explosions, the detonations of those reactors with five reactor cores up high in the building that are now confirmed gone. Uh, this is a model of NOAA of some of that radiation. It didn't include the melted reactors, but it, it, it is NOAA's model of radioactive fallout from Japan's reactors. Okay, and there was other models, uninterrupted line, this Norwegian Institute of Air Research showed an uninterrupted line of radiation. And, but it only included uh, XC-133, which, if I remember correctly, switches to cesium-137, uh, or 134, I can't remember. And but anyway, in that same plume would be the entire spectrum of uh, man-made radiation. And I'll bring up some of those depictions for everybody. Pronto! So I got that right. Oh. Okay. So, no matter what the isotope was in the model is in that model uh let that continue to play no matter what is in they're saying xc 133 but all the other isotopes are there also in the same model right so neptunium is going to be there plutonium is going to be there americium curium is going to be there which is the biggest byproduct of the fuel rod and would account for the majority of those isotopes in atmospheric science, we know how air pollution is transported on the mid-latitude westerlies across the Pacific Basin in North America. Uh, North America had received a large fallout. Now, even NOAA admitted that, and even Japan media and universities admitted that there was a large fallout in North America. Computer simulation shows how radioactivity is spread around the world from the disabled Fukushima Daiichi plant. The simulation was created by a group of researchers of, at the University of Tokyo and Kyushu University and released on Wednesday. The simulation is based on the scenario in which contaminated air was vented from the disabled number two reactor building on March 14th, three days after the massive earthquake and tsunami. Computer images show the radioactive material was lifted 5,000 meters into the air. It was then carried by westerly winds and spread over the Pacific Ocean. The images indicate that on the fourth day after the being, being vented, the substances reached the west coast of the United States, and on the, on the seventh day, they approached Iceland after crossing the Atlantic. But they're only looking at iodine. They weren't looking at that full spectrum of radiation. <clears throat> Keep going. Now, what we do here is go back, back, go back, 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 back. Fire balloons uh, they were using in Japan were found everywhere within three days, right? Or three days for it to cross the Pacific. Computer that's, simulation shows. That's why his stuff is pertinent. And these places are. Uh, the documentation. Trans-Pacific air pollution is something we already understand. Like it's something we already got modeled out from um, from pollution. This is radioactive fallout, but we know Trans-Pacific air pollution, how that works. We know the Fukushima forecast didn't include the full spectrum. They only talked about cesium or iodine or XC-133, which is the same as cesium. 
But at least he talked about it and recognized it. And so do we. But we also recognize there's all these other isotopes. And we also recognize how the jet streams work. And he mentioned Neptunian 239 is important because it changes to plutonium. Plutonium is very deadly. So is the Neptunium. It doesn't have to be plutonium. Right? The Neptunian isotopes... Neptunian isotopes... 239 is a fissionable isotope. It's man-made entirely. And let's just keep going anyway. Because otherwise I'll get off my track. So we know air pollution comes across. And this stuff is much smaller. Many, many, many uh, thousands of times smaller than the air pollution particles. We also know it's hemorrhaging directly into the ocean across the country because the pollution landed throughout the country and it works this way so if i radiate this with man-made radiation it's radioactive it has to be stored for millions of years even though it'll break down in that period of time and disappear but it still has to be by law by by rights and everything else should be contained forever and but this will radiate that and two of these will then radiate this and three of these will radiate that and four of those will radiate this so it started off with this getting irradiated but that irradiates this this radiates that radiates this radiates that these radiate them they radiate this and that never stops that's a cycle of radiation And so when the particles are stretching right across the Pacific Ocean and evidence of sharp features are modeled by Health Canada, the Canadian government, pretty hard to ignore, pretty hard to say, well, I'm going to go a little deeper down the rabbit hole, try to sort that out. We know trans-Pacific air pollution is real, so why are they saying it can't make it over when we got all this documentation? because of how bad it, this stuff actually is so swiss meteorological bureau um september the 7th had showed how particles from fukushima but we didn't need that but it helps but we know right true air pollution how this stuff works yeah U.S. warned France about publishing high radiation doses for infants. So they were, like, that's a death sentence. You don't need to live in the environment, and even though these people are. And we know that from all the dog studies, like Gilmetti, they, the dogs at Loveless Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico, Albuquerque, 144 dogs is the prime example. They um, all died. So the stuff is very, very dangerous for a very long period of time. It's very, it's modeled out from many major institutions. The releases, we know it came over. And therefore, therefore, when you think about the fallout on the vegetation in South Florida, Ultimately, all of that um, washes down to the coastline. And so the coastline is where you would go looking, and we did, for the damage. Because the coastline is the nursery of the Pacific Ocean. And that whale, there's a few tourists right alongside of me, but that whale didn't care it came right up alongside of us i just pulled in and dropped my anchor now what's interesting about this story is as i'm documenting as i'm documenting the coastline of north america this is what the whale is feeding on right below the boat where i'm too i just launched the baby zodiac from the big zodiac 
And these little bullheads is what the whales were feeding on. Not shrimp, which is their food, and krill, which is their major food, and herring and sardines and anchovies. This is a humpback whale. We'll show you some good shots coming up. I'll turn the music down. I'll just let that play out. It's about a minute more. This is what the whales are, they're about the size of your pinky. That doesn't give you much context. Next one, hopefully. I'll just jump ahead a bit. It'll be the next clip, maybe, I'm thinking about. So the eel grass, you can see there's the eel grass right there. Really bad shape. All the kelp is in really bad shape. Look how all the kelp is full of these holes. Now that starfish is one of the few starfish you see. And I'll show you some pictures of starfish coming up. We did, I go back to try to get another shot of them. And you can just let that finish out. Look how bad the kelp is. This is a theme you're gonna see throughout today. And much better detail coming up. I thought it'd be fun if we played that. And this, we have to assume is now uh, this is what the whales were feeding on these bullheads and this is really shallow like one foot of water or something and so i got the camera on a stick and i'm just hoping to catch a shot but they're moving away from the camera just barely but you see how shallow it is we're almost out of the water Hang on, I'll move ahead first. So this is the nursery is why they're hanging out in there. Very shallow, it's hard for whales or predators to get in that shallow, obviously, or impossible. And we're almost on the beach where that's shallow, but that's where they're hanging out. So I was trying to get my shot. Maybe here. This is what the whales are eating. They were there all day. All day. Because there's jack shit left in the ocean. The whales are emaciated throughout the whole coastline and starving to death. And we got another uh, couple of videos of that coming up. This is the whales. Look at him. He's right by, he's right on, it's like 10, 15 feet right here. And they, and they do look that color underneath. Not all of them, but quite a lot of them will have that white patches on the bottom of their tails for humpback whales. It's one of the way you identify them. And you can see... My anchor is hanging over the bow. It's on the bottom. I'm sitting here. Now, I've been there for about six hours. And he's feeding on that algae or those bullheads. 
and here's another video of the coastline of a whale pounding its tail and I'm gonna just stop the music and play that you may hear me yelling at Zoe because it's one of the rare chances we got to <laughs> one of the rare chances we ever got This is where there was two of them there. He's breaching. And so I didn't even, I had to zoom way in. And then I was like, oh shit, I actually shot pictures of that. Wow. And it came out. That's the, I didn't know they came out till I zoomed in and checked them. But once again, this is back uh, Cape Scott with the anchor on the ground. And he's right alongside of me, yeah? He's right there, man. He's going right under the very bow, bow of the boat because there's only 20, 25 feet there. And right up on the very tip of Vancouver Island. Let me come back up to a map so we'll zoom back in on that map. Maybe. There we go. So there's the top of Vancouver Island. Right, Port Hardy's up above that Bull Harbor. It's Cape Scott to the left. So those arrows are the accumulation of 260 days, 15,000 miles of the coastline. You can find the documentation up at the nuclearproctologist.org. We're going to continue talking about this. is from Fukushima. What we're looking at um, is an extinction event for the Pacific Ocean. Hang on. So the whale is hanging around me for hours, probably about 12 hours altogether. I spent a night there. It was too rough to go around the top of Vancouver Island. I went around the next day. And so he's hanging out right alongside of me. He's about uh, 40 feet long or something, 45 feet long. And... A little fast, I know, on the pictures, but. And so he's puking up water. And those were the cameras Paulette Audrey bought. And we got some really good pictures. It's too bad, I don't know what I'm doing. But these happen to be stunningly good, and I clipped them out. I thought they were really, they were really telling the story. And at the same time, these whales are starving to death. We're in the middle of nowhere. There was another trip where me and Terry, uh, let me see, Bella Bella, let me set this up here, Bella Bella, way up the coastline, uh, Banks Island, Aristobal, right, up, right below Aristobal Island, Aristobal is right in the middle, and there's an arrow with like, no name. Well, you can see Bella Bella right there in the middle. I'm sorry. The red arrow. And the, well, with those just outside on the ocean side where the red arrows are too. 
That's what we're talking about. And so we camped out on the shoreline, set up a tent. Me and Terry was up there. And that's the back gate of where we were. And I'm not sure. This is right in front. This is where the, you can see the mooring line for the skiffs. Not a good picture, Dana. Something better. So we got the skiffs moored out in the water. We're there for eight days. And we, we averaged a couple of thousand pictures a day. But at high tide, it would come right up to the tent. So it's obviously low tide right there, right now. Where I took those pictures. But we we took our time. We didn't like it was miserable, but we 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 spent the whole time nonstop. We documented it, posted it all up at the nuclear proctologist dot org where you can now go over and look at it. And um, Poachers Island So we'll come back over to that one. Let's come back over and tell the rest of that story. So the fallout from vegetation uh, was over a thousand times limit. That's because it wasn't just XE-133 coming through, right? It was uh, a full a full range of isotopes, all those different isotopes. So it wasn't just uranium, but that is the biggest product and you don't hear about it. And then it's plutonium, right? That's what the reactors are running on. And then all this other stuff is the byproduct. So XE, Xenon, 133, and that's what Let me see if we can get that technical data decay chain. Oh, it's screwed up. They screwed up. There it is there. So that's the known isotopes of XE, right? <laughs> but you got to think about all these isotopes are man-made. All of them are terrorist weapons. All of them, nothing on the planet is has ever encountered them before. All of them are walking nightmares. And these reactors are totally destroyed. They were full of those reactor cores and the buildings are completely annihilated. annihilated. Now, but take into consideration, take, take into consideration that the reactor core is in the center of the building. Look at your base. That's the center of the building, right? They're 60 feet underground and 190 feet above the ground, right? That's 190 feet high, 150 feet wide. 190 feet high, 150 feet wide, and another additional 60 feet under the ground in the torus. Right, the bottom of the reactor where the water is circulating, that's irrelevant. The reactor cores are up high in the building. They're the red, let me back it up. The red depictions, those red, that red behind me there, and that red, that's five reactor cores like you see here in the center of the building. So important because no one's going to uh, really work that into your narrative. So those reactor cores and the buildings are gone. Total destruction. They've been lying to you for that whole time. Yeah? So just a quick explanation. Explanation. We'll come back over um, to, to the other one. Fukushima on the other side. Let's keep moving. So the red is where all the people died. Hi, everybody. 
in the comments section, sitting around at home on your weekend, hanging out, doing your own thing, having a life. Plutonium is a byproduct of uranium. If you take um, Mark's mud, if you take, if you take uranium two thirty eight and bombard it with neutrons, they'll accept in in a certain condition. They'll all turn into plutonium two thirty nine, which is a fissionable product. So you took two thirty eight and got a hundred percent out of it. But what you've done was you created hell on earth. <coughs> now they do that, they do extract it. That's what uh, the fuel facilities are doing. They're trying to extract a fissionable product and then re-burn it. And, but by doing that, you're releasing it into the environment. It's all you're doing. You can't get rid of it. You can't destroy it. You're releasing it in increments back into the environment. So the law has been going on for a very long time, but since Fukushima has happened, now that's all the power plants from the same spot where the coastline, the red is where people died, the yellow are people missing, and they died missing because that came through 400 kilometers of the coastline. That 400 kilometers of the coastline is uh, where the reactors are also, 215 of them. And so they've been able to line to you. Uh, this is a 100-foot building over here. The one behind me uh, is supposed to be 190-foot high, twice as high, and 150 feet wide. I'm trying to build you a image so you understand the actual structures themselves and how big they really truly are. Because these behind me are supposed to be 190-foot, but the one over there is just an 80-foot apartment building. Obviously, the 80-foot apartment building is still not even equal or is, is much higher than what's left. So if we look in the bigger buildings, 130-foot, 190-foot comparisons, you really start to get it. The reactors are 190-foot high and 150-foot wide, but they blew up and caught fire blew up, lost their inventory. And so when you start looking at the actual true depictions, right, and you start thinking about how big a hundred, a 13 story building is still not nowhere near as big as that 990 foot building, yeah? So when you really start to jam it in the perspective, you ended up, no matter how you done it, saying hey hang on a second for starters it doesn't look like this on the inside no matter who tells and you, you can see that there are other uh, MIT right after Fukushima important. and they're talking about the fuel poles up high in the buildings probably is to notice that the spent fuel is stored in the upper regions of this building and the refueling implies that the fuel will have to go from the core up and then down into this uh, pool. Right, so it's got to go up and down into that depiction we were talking about. And so those people are dead over there to the left picture. And this is the fake one behind me. They claim is inside the building to your left, but that's all gone. It's all gone, right? And the big controversy was about losing power. So did you think they got power restored over there? And the significance of it is... If they lose power to those, uh, the, to that reactor or to any other reactors uh, past a few hours from now, uh, you might reach a three mile... Well, that one shouldn't have been that loud, whatever. You might re reach a three mile island. Because it actually did. It's all gone, right? And so... Here's another really good look at it. Just the homeless, the destitute, the victims of society. So look at the one behind me. That's unit four. You see that yellow bulb? That's supposed to be in the center up about 140 feet up. <coughs> and then right alongside is part of the reactor core. You can't see it from that angle, I'm sure. But Okay. 
And here's Helen telling you on the top of this building is that pool over there. Uh, building four is also similarly fragile and it's got a huge cooling pool on top with all its fuel rods, but they have been removing them. Uh, and it's been a very delicate procedure and they've removed almost all. So if that collapsed now, I think it would probably be okay. <laughs> She's saying, right? She knows that's a fake picture, but that's what they're talking about where they're taking the fuel out of the building behind me, but that's obviously not real, right? It's fake. They, they, they faked it. They lied to you. Um, and especially building three is very fragile. It's still got a huge cooling pool on its roof, protected, protected by nothing. The molten core has melted its way down onto the concrete of the containment vessel, but... 9,000 degree Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit temperatures. And the poles don't got no containment around them, so they're, but they're fine. <laughs> so she's batshit dangerous. Um, the unit four was... Um, uh, this is was damaged twice. It was damaged by, by. I don't know why that was so loud. My apologies. That occurred, and it was also uh, I'll damaged check from by now a series on. of explosions. Over. I really don't know why he's doing that. The master volumes are all set at normal, so they shouldn't have jumped automatically. For, um, the first week or two of the of the accident, so the, the the building is structurally weakened. Now this is a nuclear expert, Arnie Gunnarsson. Now Tokyo Electric's acknowledged that they went in. In, uh, in May and June of last year. He's saying they went into a building you can't go in for a thousand years. So he came out and lied to you, manipulated you. That's the only reason to do that, see? This is more than a year ago and put an enormous number of extra structural supports directly under the fuel pool. To there, he's insane. Keep the bottom of the pool from breaking through. You couldn't even get close, you will die. The bodies will pile up all around the building. You still can't make it in there. So, wow. So they, the dirty experts that were sent out to trick us, to manipulate us, and make us think that it's, it's harmless, and reality is totally destroyed. That's two, looks at that building he's talking about, Unit 4. And that's two other sides. So that's all four sides of it. And here's the comparison. The fuel poles, fuel poles, way up in the building. This is a 190 foot building. That's what's left of it. That's what Helen Callicott and Ernie Gunnarsson just manipulated you. And so this is causing an extinction event along the coastline of British Columbia, Canada. And what we done was we went out and documented done species counts insect counts bird counts right along the whole coastline and these are before and after pictures of louise narrows and now louise narrows for those not familiar is one two three four five <coughs> five arrows above my head See Arrow, right in that, sh that valley. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of nowhere. And the, you know, I went right to the Alaska border. Went right to the Alaska border and we, we hit the whole coastline. And, w and what we found was an extinction event. Now we're gonna head back up this spring. We're gonna live stream that coastline. And it's obvious we got a lot of equipment now and gear. <coughs> I don't know what's wrong this morning. Pull out the coastline. Now I spent 14,000 hours underwater. I'm not some random person. And before I left the East Coast, I had 30,000 hooks, 120 gill nets. Etc. Etc. All the licenses and the fishery claps. I came out to the west coast, fourteen thousand hours, but I went to the east coast, dove the east coast also. And so the people you see on the beach there, that's just me frigging around with my software. I dear, I went there and took the picture. That's my zodiac. But what I done was, I dare all me on the beach. That's all just me. 
just to give us some kind of context for people, it's all Danas with dinner on beaches with radiation suits on. And then I kind of took it to hell. And at one point, I put like 65 people. And so look at a starfish. And this is what the starfish are supposed to look like. It's a big difference in the colors, right? So it degrades a lot when you put all those people on the beach like that. Because I don't know what I'm doing, right? So you only put a few there to kind of get away with it. But in order to kind of articulate the story, because think about the 5,600 highly visible species that we're used to seeing in that zone. Think about how rich and diverse and amazing that environment actually truly was. So we done the whole coastline bar nothing. And let's keep going. Hello to everybody. I got something screwed up to it. Kind of like that. That's not going to help shit, Dana. Uh, let's try this. Who knows what I got done now? Uh, there we go. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Maybe I screwed up. Let me see if I can fix it. Uh, I'm going to screw up. Nobody knows what I got done. Hang on, I'll figure it out. Okay. Still not what I was hoping, but I'm better. So this... Um, is Poacher's Island. And Poacher's Island... Let me come back down here again now. Poacher's Island. I'll get it. I got it. Poacher's Island is on the coastline. I'm going to move myself now. I got to get fancy. Poacher's Island is right in behind where my finger is too. So it's up there quite a long ways. And let's jump into that stuff. And let's keep going. Okay, hang on. All everything. I got a little troll in the covered section. This is ought to be awesome. <laughs> Maxi Matt says, you're incorrect. Max says, at this point in time, there have been no massive explosions of that nature in Japan. Otherwise, Japan would become uninhabitable. Do you even know what you're talking about? What are you talking about, man? Like cancer takes 10, 20, 30, 40 years to manifest to get diagnosed. No link to you. That's too bad. Link. Um, Elaine, get rid of that, will you? That's nonsense. Let's keep the show going. If you're going to come in here and lie, we're not going to put up with it. So, goodbye. <laughs> Wherever you want to be, go off somewhere else where people are stupid and don't come here. Uh, Man-made radiation, we cover that constantly. We're not here to play games like that, idiot. I don't know if you can see it. Banks Island. Boom 25, I guess. Nuts. Nice. We're going with it. So we're okay. Definitely, uh, you wouldn't want to 
want to break down. And by the way, Japan is uninhabitable. <laughs> Hang on, actually. Let's go play with those numbers. Japan. Hey, Japan. Let's go look at some numbers for Japan for something to do. Keep the trolls happy. Just bear with me. I just dig out Japan. I got a big list of this shit. Oh, to be in Japan. It'll take me a second. Hang on. Bear with me. Don't panic. Ocean, ocean reactor videos. SB Brown. Japan. I got it. I got Japan. There we go. <laughs> Let's bang into Japan for a while. He says, oh, Japan's not, not radiated, Tina. Thank you, Elaine. Good stuff. Oop. And let me get rid of that last one because that's trouble. <laughs> in a different way. And that's supposed to be in that foil. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Japan. Japan, 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 Japan. Let's get some music shit happening here. So he says Japan is not contaminated. Okay. Absolutely irresponsible. Com company that built all the reactors is in charge of decontamination. And the government is dumping tons of radioactive mud from the rivers at nighttime. Yeah, this is a lawyer from Canada, but it could be a true story, but he's a well-known lawyer too. Dumping Fukushima radioactive water is government's only solution. <laughs> Doesn't know what to do with it. Well, there's no damage, Dana. That's 300 tons a day, Dana, but it's, that's, that's for all, Dana, boy. Radiation triple May levels, which were extraordinary and cause for evacuations from a community. A community. Now, you're not evacuating because of killer beers or cougars or elephant stampeding. No, because of invisible microscopic atoms man-made. Extremely regrettable to Fukushima workers dumping the radioactive waste from the beginning into the rivers and the lakes and the estuaries. The residents are forced to dump the nuclear waste in the parks and forests. Yeah, it's uninhabitable. You little fucking freak. Radioactive force of permanent risk you little monster, you little idiot, you little dummy. Radioactive fallout and rain 10 times more than originally reported, asshole. Radioactive rain caused 130 schools in the Korea to close, yet 10 times more in the rain in California than ever told anybody, idiot. Enormous spread of radiation in the hills, dipstick. Gee, Danny gets a little excited. Just saying, man. Come on, bring it, baby. Tokyo up to 300,000 backwards a square fucking meter. World's largest drinking water reserve. Stupid. Yeah, it's uninhabitable. Bird brain. You know, go fucking jump off your roof and kill yourself so you don't accidentally have children and have the other stupid people like you on this fucking planet already. <gasps> Tap water is out of control. Out of control. No, nah, Dan, it's uninhabitable. Anyway, let's get back to my story. What I was talking about before you come out and fucked with me today. You definitely don't want to break down this <laughs> shit. <laughs> and that's Vanilla Island. You probably can't see it, but... Put this away till I get to see. It's a long way up the coastline. Let's put it that way. So we drop the pick and we go hit the beaches in Poacher's Narrow. And it's the only spot on the... Well, as far as I can remember, that we took pictures and published them. But as far as I remember, it's the only spot where we've seen cockles. An actual beach full of cockles or any other uh, normal looking beach. There was nothing else there. Uh, just the kelp weed, the kelp cabbage. And a couple of more algaes. It should be 700 algaes. 
Should be 700 algaes and this incredible, unbelievable, inconceivable diversity of life should be there also. Yeah, to your left. Right? There should be this incredible, inconceivable smorgasbord of life everywhere you go. Let's keep going. Uh, but we did find Zoe taking a big crap. She shit on just about every beach we hit. This was a... Let me double check my videos. Make sure I got them. And so the sun was setting. No, that was early in the morning. Okay, I got you. The sun's rising. Now this beach... Uh, was a little tricky. And I'll explain why in a little video when I get to it. This is way to frig up towards Alaska. This was part of a five month expedition without making it home. Me and Zoe went and conquered the coastline. But this is a. Um, I can zoom in, hang up. This is a fascinating. It's the only time we got pictures of this on the whole coastline. This is the only spot, Poacher's Narrow. Poacher's Narrow is famous for cockles, beaches. And there's probably more than one beach there with cockles on it. But it's the only example that we've seen on the whole coastline in 15,000 miles was in Poacher's Narrows. Pretty cool, man. But these are all dead. None of these are alive. Uh, but there were live ones there spitting. They're very easy to recognize. They spit. So Poachers and Arrows, this is the beach where I was anchored off to. I hid away way in there. I changed positions uh, 12 o'clock at night because the wind had come up and I went in there and hid away. Uh, real tricky spot, yeah? I came in the back door, obviously. But... Uh, it's a very fucking dangerous spot. So I hate when the trolls come here and play games. Because I went into these fucking places in bad weather and got on the beach and fucking got busy. Obscured. Visibility one mile in fog. Wind south. Low by voice. Three gusting two two. Seized. Two Hang on. Chop with a low westerly swell. Well, it's quarter after seven. In the morning, we moved in here last night at 11 p.m. and anchored at high tide. You can see it's low tide now. There is nothing on these rocks. It's pretty foggy. I don't know. Might have to stay an extra day and do this tomorrow when there's a bit more daylight. We'll see. Another half an hour will be low tide. I don't know how the hell I squeezed myself into this spot. <laughs> I got lucky. But it was too windy on the other side last night. I had to pull the pick and make my way over here. Zoe sleeping. Kind of. You okay, Zoe? Hey, 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 hey. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, good morning, Zoe. And, yeah... You can see it. <laughs> there is nothing on these rocks. Just uh, two or three algaes. There's no starfish. It's a two-foot tide, so it's super low. Anyway. Zoe. Well, we'll figure it out, I guess. I have to have a cup of tea. I don't see no shells, no starfish, no sea anemones. Just, a, just naked beaches. A couple of little birds. Oh well. Zodiac's ready to go. Might as well get ready and go have a look anyway. Yeah, well that's what you're doing there, Dina. Well Zoe, you're going to be full of mud before you get back to the boat. And the boat is right there. We're right here. Where that was a cockle squirted up near that time. 
There's a couple of cockles here, which is a snake, um, a clam. That's a rare occasion to see those on any of these beaches. But the beach is naked. It's slack toyed on the 13th of August. And there's enough daylight to get some pictures, so let's get some. And it's pretty miserable weather. I've been on the ocean for five months straight at this point, but here's um, some sea urchins underwater. I don't know if you can see it, but there's some red sea urchins. But interestingly on the beach is cockles. I'm not sure how that's going to come out. Let's have a look here. So there's cockles in on that beach there, and we don't see them uh, at all on the whole coastline. And so let's go in and have a look at those things. Sun's coming out again. Better watch out what I'm doing here. There's a bunch of rocks around me. The wind's starting to pick up. I go ahead, I'll hit that rock. I go back, I can kind of move back. There's red sea urchins down here now, finally. It's the first ones we've seen this morning. I've seen a couple of starfish down there. It's a two foot tide. We're in Poacher's Narrows. And we're right at that little Tony Eddy passage. Okay, I gotta shut this off. The kelp is really bad. Look at the kelp. Wow. Look at the kelp. Look at the kelp. It's friggin' rotten. And there's nothing on the shoreline whatsoever, but there's a few urchins down below the two foot low tide line and a couple of uh, leather starfish. I think we've seen two types of starfish this morning. They don't look healthy, but. Let's go ashore. Check out the I couldn't get in on that side. And we got in on this side. And that's the passage we're trying to do. We're going to do this side because the sun is only going to light up that side. It's hard to get pictures. But uh, you can see all that slime. I don't know what that is. That's probably pollution or something. That stuff because I don't see it. And But these cockles. Look at that. Wow. Right? And all the beaches should look like this and all the other little necks and manillas and all the other, but I mean, this is almost all cockles. And you'll see them spitting. See if you find an area where they're spitting up the, this end down here doesn't seem like it's so entrenched. As bad as that other side. But anyway, what they do is you'll see them spitting up water if I just focus in on an area, you might see them. See right there. Let me see if we can get a one of them puking it up. But anyway, we're seeing them spitting here. And that means there's, obviously with these shells, right, there's a thriving cockle environment right here. And, that's, and look at how big the barnacles are right there. There's a couple of Clintons. A couple of Clintons. Let's get a look at them. Let's get a look at the Clintons and the big barnacles and the cockles. How interesting is that? They'll slice your zodiac wide open. Those barnacles. But anyway, let's get some pictures. So you can see, I'm going to turn the motor off. You can see how fast the tide floods through here. Hey Zoe, yeah, the tide flies through here. And, you know, excuse me, I don't have no tripod again. They snapped. I can't afford to buy tripods over and over because I don't got that kind of money. That's just the way it works, unfortunately. But anyway, you can see how fast the tide flies through this whole area. This is Poacher's Narrow. It's August the 13th, 2015. And the wind is blowing towards me. The wind is coming this way towards us, the camera, but we're moving that way. We'll just line it up on the shore. We should go the opposite way we're actually going with the toy. And the idea, what I'm trying to show people here is that they're on the open west coastline where the 
current gets sucked through these great big channels and then you got these little narrows where it just flies the current flies through here then you, and this is a two foot low tide you would expect you would expect at least some life here because there's so much a body of water moving through here and the ocean is a super life so it should recede everything and we're going to go show that beach right there and these barnacles here big barnacles i gotta watch those guys they slice up the zodiac almost got me killed in the charlotte Strait. but we're gonna go we're gonna go down through to the end poachers narrows up by banks island close to it and we're just waiting for the sun to pop out here you can see the sun moving towards me right now give it a few seconds and the sun is going to be right on top of us and that whole shoreline okay so we're good to go back in and show more pictures a dirty screen earlier so we're probably going to have some bad pictures progress is the things then i clean the screen and everything's good but we're flying the opposite the wind is blowing pretty good too about 15 northwest at us from that direction ahead, but the current is sucking us straight through. So there's enormous volume of water here, uh, all day, every day going through here. And if you look at the shoreline, that's how it looks symmetrically. Let me stabilize this. That's how it looks throughout the whole area here. It's a couple of algaes, a couple of barnacles, no, just one type of barnacle, just a joint Pacific barnacle, and some leather starfish, some cockles, which is something we've never seen before in any beaches like that. That's the only time we've seen it. And so all beaches should look exactly like that, full of different horse clams and manilas and little necks and razorbacks and oysters and scallops, abalone shells. At least it was cockles, so. and they buried themselves in the water and they their filter feeders. But it's early morning, the tide is just starting to rise now. Oh, now we're going back with the wind, now the wind is blowing us back. We must have hit a little eddy, I guess we would. Anyway, let's go get some pictures. So if the tide had been a bit higher, I would have ran up on top of those barnacles. Yeah. If the tide had been a bit higher. I was really careful coming in, but probably barnacles right underneath that. Let's see how the integrity of that is. Yeah, it looks okay. Yeah, that's that's a uh, this is a dangerous spot for a zodiac. That's all barnacles right there. You can see how fast the tide moves in the center of this tank has a little funnel point right and you can see so you would expect to find an amazing amount of life in a spot like that yeah Does that make sense to anybody and it's just boiling through here and i'm going to get back in close to shore and document this yeah and so just quick comparison we'll jump back to the videos but a quick comparison is the beach should be full of life <laughs> period it should be just totally full of life and like it should be amazing you know experience this is what it looked used to look like the whole coast of canada was this incredible unbelievable diversity and like we've done this whole coastline now i'm not digressing or something let's just um hang on you got whales and dolphins dying all over the coastline Millions of birds dying off. Believe one of the orcas that calls Washington waters home has died and now. 
I'm going to play this clip where all the orcas are emaciated. Now, remember, the orca whale could eat sharks and seals and sea lions and halibut and everything else, right? And they claim here that the orcas are starving to death because the salmon are gone or not there or whatever, but that's not true. Orcas eat everything. Go look it up yourself. You'll find new headlines where they claim that's true, but if you go look at the actual literature, they eat otters, they eat birds, they eat everything. There's nothing. They eat unicorn if they could find it. And so this story is very telling, though. I got a cup of tea just boiled out. And so by the time this clip is over, I'll be back in the chair. Now her calf is in danger. As King 5's Glenn Farley reports, this I'll latest loss now leaves us with as few as 80 whales. Washington's orcas belong to families. Scientists call them pods. And those pods have letters, J, K, and L. And this is J-Pod and Happier Times as seen from Sky King swimming in the San Juans a few years ago. Like highly visible fingerprints, orcas are easily identified by the distinctive patterns on their backs, referred to as saddle patches. And this month, a key member of J-Pod seemed to disappear. And it's not the first loss this year. Well, I am alarmed. I've seen the necropsy reports from J32. Ken Balcom has studied these whales, including their ability to reproduce for decades. He's with the Center for Whale Research. This is far more sinister, where we're losing reproductive females and their babies. Uh, you know, when you, when you don't reproduce anymore, you don't have a population. The news, while not confirmed by a carcass, might as well be. This is the last picture of J28 taken by Balcom on October 2nd, along with her youngest calf, J54, a male. He says the whales are emaciated, underweight, underfed, and the short supply of the whale's natural prey, Chinook salmon, forced the mothers to draw from fat. Now that's ludicrous. The whales eat everything. There's nothing the whales don't eat. It's totally disingenuous to even employ something like that. Why would you say something so blatantly stupid? Oh, the, 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 the apex predator is starving to death because it can't find salmon when it can eat everything and does. Oh, shit. Let's go down here somewhere and hit music. Keep playing that. Um. Okay. And so there's a half a million birds died at the one it's time. It's one of the biggest mysteries Alaska has seen in some time. What caused hundreds of thousands of seabirds to wash up on our shores? And as KTV 11's Lauren Maxwell tells us, there's another mystery tonight. Why the birds are no longer turning up in droves. Because they're all dead. And they're common birds that showed up on the ice. Uh, these birds are probably likely following the Kinnick River. But research into what caused it is going full speed. And many of the birds, when we perform the necropsies, they actually have empty stomachs, so we're not finding any food. They know the bird. They starved to death. Now, scientists say as many as half a million murs died. The most recent in med... This is the biggest number ever recorded. In February, up to 8,000 showed up on the shores of Lake Iliamna. Ten giant whales found dead. The chance of finding two in the same spot are astronomical. Mass die off of walruses, sea birds. This is 2015. Something out of the ordinary is happening. And they try to blame it on toxins. 337. We've never seen something like that before. We're seeing seals show up in shops, emaciated, starving to death. Tens of thousands of them dying on the coastline, coming ashore, and there's nothing to eat. And we know this is true. When they come ashore, instead of having everything to the left, what I'm showing on my expeditions throughout that whole coastline was the birds come ashore, and the top up by Prince Rupert, that's where the birds died, a half a million birds. That's where a lot of that footage you looked at today so far is from, where the birds died. Because when they came ashore, instead of being food to the left, they can pick at, but there was nothing like to the right, see? So instead of being on the left, you got what's on the right. 
Normally the birds will fly down. They see all the starfish. They know there's all kinds of other food. They don't need low tide like I do to go ashore and document it. The birds can swim down. Now those birds that starve to death can dive 600 feet. We're talking about shallow water extinction all the way to the ocean floor. We're talking about a massive cover-up is in full swing. And the extinction event is happening now. It's spread because that's what the jet streams does. There's so much of it. It has such an impact on the food chain. Uh, even the polar bears are emaciated and starving to death. That's a, a starving one. This is what a healthy one would look like. But this is what we're seeing in different places around uh, the Pacific Rim nations and where the jet streams or disposition are heavy. We're seeing this uh, die-offs that are extraordinary. I mean, these are extraordinary things that we're seeing. Uh, unprecedented. Uh, every bird they're seeing starving, starving. Starving to death. And this is what I was showing and documenting on these expeditions. You can see how fast the tide moves in the center of this tank. That's a little funnel point, right? So what this means is that fast tide is more oxygen being liberated. It's supposed to be the best of the best spots. These choke points with all this turbulence is the ideal environment for the 5,600 highly visible species we know is on this coastline. So you would expect to find an amazing amount of life in a spot like that, yeah? There's still Poacher's Can Island. Anybody? That's up close to Alaska. And it's just boiling through here. And all this deer is a couple of algaes. Close to shore and document this. So I'm leaving there, I'm heading to the outside. I'm doing all the west coast of Canada. Every 20 miles, I'm stopping and catching a low tide. And these are adverse conditions. It doesn't portray that, I'm sure, in the video. But this uh, was hell. I went through hell uh, to do what I'd done. It's all for free at the nuclear proctologist. You, the copyright is free. You can tell the story you don't need my permission but i'll be happy to give it to you i don't know if you can see it we left poacher island <laughs> if it gets any rougher we're probably going to keep on going 27 miles so we'll be there in another half an hour it's going to get rougher but that'll blow me down the outside though once i get to the outside of banks island we want to get to the outside of that island, a big frigger. Where that flag is, we want to go out around that corner of Vanilla Island. We left Poacher about 40 minutes ago. I was towing the Zodiac, but it decided to put it on the roof before I made the crossing. It's a good thing. It looks like it's going to get ugly. We like ugly. Here it goes. Check, make sure I'm not going to go up on a rock or something here. Let's back it off. So we're going to here, and then the next one we're going to run into there. It'll be shorter, 20 miles the next time. But poachers, poachers, narrows to here is about 20 nautical miles. It's pretty rough out there. I got to get in there and hide away somewhere until the night tide. So. Now. That's a melted starfish. And right alongside of it, the sea anemones. <coughs> Excuse me.
lost the audio that time. I got it. Thank goodness for meters. And so you can see the weird places where I would go ashore because that's the only spot there to go ashore. If I go ashore in behind me where the stern is, as you can see now, the stern is right into the rocks itself. So the, the, the boat is actually bouncing at times on that rock there. The, the, when the waves come in and go out. But I couldn't go behind me because that's a really bad spot. I didn't get pinned or trying to get out of there because the way the waves come in. So you find a little nook. And once I tied it off, I pulled it up a little higher. But it's naked, right? It's naked there. This algae that you're seeing, the bull kelp you're seeing is fragile. I didn't have to pull my motor out because it would just chew through it. It's ridiculous. There's nothing there. And that's the picture I'm in mean, right here. Just um, the barnacles you're seeing, uh, you can scrub them off with your feet. That's another spot. Sun's getting, I'm still here trying to get pictures even though it's late in the evening. So it's fresh water running down at low tide. Just a couple of algae, bull, uh, kelp weed, kelp cabbage again. It should be 700 algae. Incredible diversity. There was mussels and, uh, you know, some barnacles. They're not healthy or nothing. And so we're going to play a couple of videos. And I'll give you some context. This is Banks Island. I'll try to keep up with the audio. And I'm not sure... I'm just talking in this one. We'll see so how it plays we're at out. The bottom of Soden. And just give me a second. I'm going to adjust the volume right away on all of these. And that went way I know where I'm to on each so one. So we're at the bottom of Soden and Banks Island. And all this kelp here is rotten. There's a lot of it here. And the only starfish we've seen this morning were on the west side here. And, like, I don't know if you can, how good you can see it, but everything is like that. No matter where you go, it's shocking. And so there's nothing on the shoreline whatsoever, only a handful of these algaes at the 600, and all the other species are missing. And it's... It's Sunday, August the 14th, 15th, I guess, the 15th, probably, 2015, on the Expedition for Life, heading down the coast. So, we're out here on the middle of Banks Island, in Zoe. You probably can't see that, even though it's in the shadows. But what we are is, um, we're just inside the islands, and when it's high tide, that's open ocean. It comes flying through everything. And so it's a really good spot. And we're able to do it here, but it's too windy on the outside there. It's been galing all day. It was a rough trip coming down here, Ellie's trip coming down here. And so the boat is anchored up way in there. You probably can't see it anyway. I probably can't find it on this little screen, but you can see what it's going to look like here today. It's about 25 minutes from low tide, I think. Low tide is 8.24, hang on. And it's 8.53. And so, there's a kelp weed. And it looks really bad. Some algae, uh, green algae. At a 600 algae, watch what I'm doing here. At a 600 algae, just get close enough so you can see. And then at the little tiny barnacles that, if anything hits them, they crush and disappear. And there's a couple of snails. 
couple of snails there. You can't see them. There's a rock underneath me. You can't see that. Ding that. But we're gonna go, we're, cause the sun is coming this way. Cause the sun is coming this way. Then we're gonna go up to this groove here. There goes me cup of tea. Dana. Cup of tea. It's okay. So you're not gonna lie down on that, are you? I'm gonna get my foot out of the way. Anyway, cup of tea. Still got it. So this group out here. Those islands. We'll circle a whole bunch of those. It's August the 14th, Friday. And I got lots of gas. Yeah, three quarters of a tank. This tank doesn't burn any gas at all. I got down there water camera, we'll try that again. Uh, not looking good though for seeing anything, right? You can see that short hole. See how bad that looks. There's nothing there. Nothing from ahead of us, nothing behind us. And if that kelp weed and that green algae there disappears, there'll be zero. And those little barnacles, they're, they're all gone. And those little snails. But that's it. It's the same now all the way up to Alaska. Everything is completely missing. And the expedition for life. Komodo jumps all the way down this coast. We're in the middle of Banks Island. We've got the top in the north end of it. Yesterday, last night. And tonight will be the last tide of just before dark. It'll be all daylight tides after this. Just one a day, so. It'll be a long, hard trip, by the looks of it, till at least the 30th, and then you get two tides in the daylight again, low tides. But uh, if the nursery is gone, then everything else is, can't survive. There was no spider webs today in a couple of islands, me and Zoe went on too. I had to go get another a bat. And there was no spider webs again, no birds chirping. And that is really something spooky. There's nothing at the high tide line either. Nothing, zero. Right? No flana, no sword at the high tide line. Right? It will be covered with this green line. It's the high tide line. And it'd be like a couple of foot thick of it. Anyway, almost on the rocks. Kind of switch out too. And so. The reason this is happening to us, we're having a mind blowing. Everything is starving to death, deformed and abnormal. In the world's northernmost inhabited region, polar bears outnumber people. The bear brands helped make Svalbard famous. But to see them in their natural habitat requires an epic journey into the wilderness. Over a barren wasteland the size of Sri Lanka. But down there, the landscape's changing. Global warming means there's now much less sea ice than in years gone by. Polar bears depend on the ice to survive. This is where they hunt seals, rest and breed. We land in a remote corner of Svalbard where a team from the Norwegian Polar Institute have tranquilized a bear. They've covered its eyes to shield it from the harsh Arctic sun. This is a critical time for the scientists. They have to work quickly to carry out all the necessary measurements to work out the health and well-being of this magnificent bear. But Jon Ors, the world's leading expert on polar bears, is concerned. And if you feel here, you can really feel all the bones. This so... The animals are emaciated. All 3,000 up there are emaciated. This 19-year-old male, a relatively old bear, is dangerously thin, despite an apparent abundance of food. 
despite an apparent abundance of food. All of these are really strange. Birds are starving to death. Uh, federal government declares unusual mass mortality event in California. California is right below the jet stream. This was a die-off just over a couple of weeks period after the reactors. No, it wasn't from smoking. Scientists mystified because they won't talk about radiation or consider the chances of finding two dead whales is extraordinary. Right? Bottom sentence. This is kind of eerie. What are the odds of two dead whales and one in the same spot? Oh, well, yeah, they kind of hit it right on the nose. What's the chances of the bears being emaciated? Fish disappeared. Whales nearly absent. No krill. High rates of egg failure among birds. There's almost nothing there, just a lot of warm, clean water. That's really telling warm, clean water, warm. You, like most of the year, you can't even see bottom because of the soup of life itself. 80 whales wash ashore in India. I don't know if it has got something to do with it, but it is definitely. Head researcher sounding alarm over striking changes in killer whales off of Canada and Alaska. High mortality rates, odd behaviors. Experts. Yeah, who's the experts? Always these experts. Ah, expert. Experts said, send your kid off to kill other children. Otherwise, you got to pay more for gas at the pump. <coughs> Radioactive heart and livers. Rare dolphins found... Dead sea turtles washing up. I can't remember. There was like 80 of them or something, right? There was all these connotations. Sea lion. They, they're starving to death, these sea lions. They're finding. Um... But if you look at the comparison of what the animals look like and what's going on, like healthy versus sick looking, or healthy versus sick looking, yeah? Healthy starfish. Now, I took both of those pictures. The one on the right is not quite healthy, but he's a lot healthy. They're both the same species. They just come in different colors, right? There's 79 of these species. Um, I took both of these pictures. The ones on the left are in distress and dying. The one on the right was on the right was born with two legs. <laughs> and you have to worry about all these apologists coming out and lying to everybody and ignoring what really happened, pretending it's not an issue. Now all those people you see there, they're they're all me. It's just me dressed up in a suit it's just I was playing with the software to see if I can work out to see if I can work out how the layer people in there pretty good pretty convincing kind of like this one you can see how I layered the people in right <laughs> a little bit morbid Dana thank you very much hi to everybody I see Deb's out there Ellie was out there Hugs for everybody. I know nobody was expecting. Hi, Spiral. Billy, Jay, hello, everybody. Stacy, CJ. I am Thirst, Elaine. And we had to get rid of Dalamine's there, and we had to get rid of a troll earlier that was being unreasonable. And disruptive, but outside of that. So all these people on the beach, they're all me. I put them there. Each one of those little skits were a minute long. And so I ended up with like a 40-second clip of 
I just wanted to see if it worked. Could you layer yourself and make it? It wasn't, it was whatever. But anyway, that's all me. It's not actual. I didn't have all those people on the beach. I took that picture, uh, but there was no one there on the beach with me. That's in Hardigway. It's a famous shot. Everybody knows it. And this was a famous spot in Japan. Can anybody remember what it used to be? <laughs> There's another famous spot in Japan. Anybody recognize that? And see, these when these buildings blew up, right, and they left nothing left. Now, can you get power back there in a few hours? Because if you can't... If they lose power to those, uh, to that reactor or to any other reactors, uh, past a few hours from now, uh, you might reach a three mile. Three mile island. Yeah, they reached that and a few other things. See the fuel pools up high in the building? And the tops of these pools are 100 feet above ground. <clears throat> and. Hi, Charles. Illusion. Spiral. Stacy. You're welcome, everybody. Billy J. Thank you, everybody. Hugs, everybody. Overview of the Diachi Nuclear Power Station. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Let's have a little boo with that for something, though. See how much shit I can get in touching on that subject. Everything I do, I get into trouble for anyway. Number of fuel assembly, 764. By the way, I didn't gather all this off. This, this is... Uh, Magic, this happened magically. Dana didn't go out and find all this stuff and categorize it, organize it. And, uh, I'm, 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 I got voodoo. I got a little, like this little voodoo and I can just, whatever I want, it shows up like that. I'm not kidding you. No, no, I didn't do all the work and hunt all this down over years and years. No, Dana's not scripted or anything like that. Just... He just got all that stuff. He doesn't know what he got there. No idea what it is. So each assembly, number of fuel assemblies at the very top is 80 rods. Each rod is 12 feet and 18 pounds of uranium-235, plutonium-239. And uh, this is really nasty stuff. This is idiot stuff. This should never exist on our planet. It only exists because they lied to you. Uh, for 70 years. This wouldn't exist if they told you the truth. And 180 control rods. Now, uh, fuel, uranium. That's the last time you'll see him mention it. After that, all they'll talk about is iodine because the last eight days, they won't mention uranium again because that lasts 4.5 billion years. And oh, Dana, no, stuff that lasts longer has less energy. Yeah, but it's ionizing. Game over. It's very serious. And so, let me come back here. And so, where where is the shit I want it? So, oh yeah, the height primary containment. See up high, and they're in meters, forty-eight meters. That's one hundred and ninety feet. Twenty-six meters, twenty-nine. Let's go back one. Maybe I got it there. Forty-eight meters. I don't know. I lost it. it. Should be sitting right here. I don't know. Oh yeah, there it is. Reactor buildings number four up from the bottom. Ground height, 58 meters. Underground, 18 meters, which is 60 feet. 58 meters is 190 feet. Ground height, the turbine was 33. Underground, it was 15 meters, 45 feet. But above ground was 33 meters, the turbine building itself. Uh, ground height, 41 meters. Common facility. So the common spent fuel pool had 9 million pounds in it. The tsunami wiped it out. The exhaust stacks were 150 meters up. Now, does any of those dimensions 
right? You got 130 foot, not 190 foot, like the one to the left is supposed to be. But you can see, the, you know, how bad this actually is, right? No matter how you try, you can see how bad that actually is. You can see on the roof over there, people dying. That's just me fucking around with software. Let's keep getting other sign here. Hang on. Sorry. You're not helping, Dana. Hang on. I'll get it. This is what they're doing to the homeless and the destitute. The victims of society. This is what the sellouts are doing to your future, to your hopes and your dreams. They're sending in the people who don't know any better, the people that are incapable. And they're literally building a tomb of the victims of Fukushima and the immigrants coming into that country. It's the most shocking revelation we've ever seen we're talking 190 foot buildings this is why we're seeing an extinction event is because this is why they're so busy lying to you talking about iodine but instead of curium time of cesium instead of plutonium and it's just this whole this whole uh unacceptable world of of not telling the truth, not coming out and saying that's not really inside the building over there. Not people not that we put our fate into, not coming out and saying that these depictions are not actually in the building like they claim it is. It's such, it's so heartbreaking to see the nuclear activists and world activists and the big websites and everything out there not telling this story, not forcing this story down everybody's throat. Because how else are we ever going to get the story out there if we don't shove it down everybody's throat? Because they're shoving down. And they will. They'll never stop doing it. They're going to keep shoving that picture down everybody's throat because you won't come out and challenge them. And then people like me, the rare one on the planet who's actually out saying, hey, wait a second. That's your two official pictures, you know. And then they tore all the building down so the pool can't be at the top of the building. That's really something, yeah? That's really like, wow, that can't be happening. As soon as you look at the history of nuclear, Tokyo tap water was in crisis. Uh, the government near Tokyo is unable to handle it. Uh, yellowish residue. This is a million Beckles. 55 is an evacuation zone showing up in pollen. And we're talking about catastrophic, mind boggling uh, betrayal by your friends who work in the government, by the people in your community that work in the government, your universities, your institutions, your local medias. The absolute betrayal that they didn't tell you about this. And six years later, they're still thinking that it's okay. They think it's just an industrial accident when this is a catastrophic extinction level event. It's not a game. I tried last week to pretend that I can walk away for a few days and just like have a normal blog or just pick on normal everyday shit. And you feel empty when you do that. And in one sense, you can sneak in a Fukushima story. But to try to escape this reality is a betrayal to me. Uh, for me to betray myself. To pretend that this is not worthy of fighting for with everything I got all day, every day. It's just, it's just impossible to conceive that I shouldn't fight with everything I got because of the betrayal in all the other medias out there that have abrogated that responsibility. Let's 
play another little clip of the expeditions. This is um, Banks Island, Banks Island, Banks Island. Three, one minute. Well, one of these is like 18 minutes. I'll make a cup of tea if it's, if it's worth watching. Let's give it a check. Oh, this was um, on the Wild West Coast. Is around 600 turs or mers here. I'm not sure. At that time when I was shooting a video for sure. But who knows? I'm just rambling. And I never expected to ever show the video. And I haven't even watched it. But here's the birds. This is extraordinary because all together on the entire coastline, I've probably seen 14,000 when I should see 5,000 per square mile. This is really significant that we've seen this. It's August the 15th. We're in the Central Banks Island. Let me try to get that clear. Look. Black turds, black turds, seagulls, and puffins. It's the same as we've seen up there. There's probably five or six hundred here. See all the turds are on the move. They're all on the move. Anyway, there's around 500 of them off central. They don't seem to be feeding. But there's around five or six hundred birds, I guess. It's the 15th. We're on the outside of Banks Island. It's around 9.45 or something. And we're going to go alongside of all this big kelp. And you can see everything is rotten. There we go. So, might as well talk you through it. I didn't realize this one was going to be underwater. So, what you're looking at is sea urchins on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada, on Banks Island, open ocean along Saudi, straight across to Japan. It takes 45 days for the current to come all the way over here. And You've seen jellyfish up close to the surface. And the sea anemones, you see seeing down there is a giant white plume sea anemone. And he's in about 15 feet of water. And they're very unusual sight is why I'm pointing that out. Now, the red sea urchins you're looking at, I used to pick 20,000 of these a day. And uh, there should be loads of starfish because they prey upon it, but the starfish were wiped out. There's 78 species of starfish. Not all of them are predatory because uh, uh, these are big uh, sea urchins. I'll go make my cup of tea. Let's just keep playing. 
put the music back on. That one was called Sleeping Sheep. Hang on a second. Let's stop it right there. That's a great shot. Let's go back a little snot. Let's come ahead. And so you're able to see uh, Joint C Plume seeing enemies. Now, I was kicked at a Banfield for going in and asking him where was the Joint C Plume seeing enemies. And they said, in 40 years at Banfield Research Institute on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada, there were 70 universities. There's supposed to be 7,000 species outside their place. I found 14. And so I went in to ask them where the species were, and they barred me, kicked me out, yelled at me, screamed at me, physically put their hands on me. Well, and I'm crippled. We'll let this play for a little bit. I'll make a cup of tea. I'll be right back. So what you're seeing is almost all sea urchins. And that's normal. That's what you expect to see throughout the whole coastline of North America is this smorgas... Uh, well, there should be 7,000 highly visible species. Now, what you should see is joint plume sea anemones, particularly the white ones. in a lot of those spots. The urchin shouldn't be there. It should be surrounding the joint sea plume. They should dominate that whole area. And there are spots where now, right here, you can see some of the little rock cod, green kelpling, rock fish. There's around 50 species. They're way up the food chain compared to the other 4 million species. But look how bad the kelp is in all of this. Kelp is unbelievably terrible. Turn that down. The kelp is unbelievably terrible. And so those little fish, you expect to find that for like 100 years, but you won't. You expect parts of the food chain to disappear from a bad accident, but you wouldn't expect the whole tidal zone to be wiped out. And just because you see starfish in the ocean or you see a few algaes, look how bad. All these white spots are uh, the death of... Now, this is through the whole coastline year-round now is what the kelp looks like. And so think about a tree... If, you, if, if the white was where you tore the bark off the tree, that's what the white uh, is the uh, equivalent of. The kelp is completely destroyed. This is 50-foot bull kelp you're looking at. And you don't see the urchins climbing the kelp. These are big uh, kelp beds. I'm in there driving around, and if I get that on my prop, normally my engine would stall. But you'll notice as this video is playing, the boat doesn't stall. Now you don't see me clearing the prop. In total, this video is 18 minutes. We're going to play it all. If it's clean and clear enough, like this is good enough to look at. So look how bad 
the kelp is. I've never seen this. The whole coastline is totally destroyed all year long. And this is uh, the other 700 species are already killed off. This is one of the biggest species. Sea urchins are a big species. You don't expect them to be killed off. They're the same family as starfish, though. And the jellyfish, yeah. You know, all together we counted it was 100 species. Uh, not quite 100, but you can go through the documentation that's up at my website, the nuclearproctologist.org, and you won't find any extra species that I don't already include. Now, there should be 5,600 highly visible species. There should be a smorgasbord, what you're looking at right there, but all you're seeing is uh, red urchins. Uh, and so there'd be, there's no detail here either, mind you, but there would be all of these different 600 algaes would be highly visible. And these kelp greenlings you're seeing here, if that's what it is, there's uh, 50 species of rockfish. That looks like the kelp greenlings. And the camera we're using underwater is just... It's a very nice camera. Paulette, Audrey bought it. And we never do thank Paulette enough. And so it's nice to mention her. And no, the fish are not swimming upside down. That's me freaking around. Trying to get the best shot. And this one, we're particularly fortunate because we got lots of good, clean shots. And see, that is what I'm normally used to, what you're seeing there. Not the kelp, though, that colors. But remember, I got 14,000 hours underwater. These are familiar sights for me. But on the shoreline, that would be full of all kinds of diversity. And I'll give you a, a general idea what I mean by that. There's a couple of iconic pictures that really kind of make you understand to your left over there the rocks underwater should look like the left over there right the, wa the rocks underwater should be full of the stuff you're seeing to the left it should be that kind of a mix right when you see sea urchins there should be that huge diversity to you there at the exact same time but that that rocks to your the, on your left right when you when you're looking at this underwater footage Think about that stuff to the left, right? Because that's that diversity is missing as we play through that. I'll go make my cup of tea now that it's steeped. But so, this is very unusual to see all these fish. Uh, these are the one species. They could all come from the same family easily, most likely did. And that is normal for them to, to aggregate together like that. That's an awesome shot. Yeah, I like that shot. But look at the rocks. There's nothing else there, just these urchins. I'll be right back. Put some music on for you. No. Okay, that'll work.
We got one screen not working for some reason. I'll check. I froze up today. Sorry about that. I'll get it. Yeah. I must have clicked on it when I sat there back in the chair. I went and grabbed a cup of tea. My apologies. Look how bad the kelp is. So this is what all those sea urchins eat is that kelp, yeah? And that's all good. One of those days where you get a good stream in. And once again, when you look at all these, even though I don't, you know, it's not high quality. You're talking about trying to get underwater shots. You're just lucky to get anything. And we're so lucky. And this might, I'll scoot ahead. Oh. Pick it up right there. Cleaned up. See the white giant plume seeing enemies? They're the white ones down there. They're up to two to three feet. So hard to find them when every part of the coastline, you get up to 500 per square meter. Up to 500 of those plumes, giant seeing enemies per square meter. It was regular the entire coastline, all the way up to the high tide line. Not just low tide, but all the way to the high tide. They're missing. And so you're just so fortunate to see them. But those uh, urchins see all the gaps in the rocks. Now, that's not unusual. Like I said, I used to pick 20,000 of them a day. Year after year. 315 days average a year on the ocean. 100 day trips back to back. Uh, spent my whole life on the boat oceans, Atlantic and the Pacific running operations highball multi-million dollar operations my whole life and I come from that whole history of 400 years of it but I also have a unique perspective on sea on nuclear as a as a long time activist long before Fukushima happened anti-nuclear researcher independent trying to get to the bottom trying to get the truth trying to understand the industry long before Fukushima happened and so when I sound adamant it's it's because I am able to articulate it and if you look at and this will be finished out pretty soon another couple of minutes I'll just jump ahead deep water it's hurt oh let's go back and catch that Let's go back, 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 right here. I'll do some stopping. We'll do some zooming if we get a clean shot. Not that I know what I'm doing. I'm going to zoom in. Sweet. I'll do some stopping and zooming if we can get a clean, clear Uh, kelp greenlings they usually hang out in small schools 10 20 30 40 they like points of land but look how you can see see when you see the kelp down low all that white it really stands out for me it looks like a plastic bag on the ocean floor when it's moving that's the kelp should never ever look like that and that whole, e well, it should be six to seven hundred algae kelp steer. And bull kelp, of course, is the biggest one. And it's destroyed. What you're seeing there is dying. It's so thin on the bottom, the urchins don't even try to climb it. Normally, the urchins climb it. And. Okay, Dalamine, you take care. OK, 
Okay, let's keep going. There's a good shot. Kelp Greenlings. Beautiful shot. Play it, zoom at the same time. So I'm just zooming in right now, zoom back out. Look how bad that friggin' kelp is. We've never seen that. And so in the background, right there, it should be this whole diversity going on, right? On the rocks behind it, to your left. All of that should be there to your left, right? It should be this just smorgasbord of different lives underwater. It should be all of these. This is all BC, well-known, documented marine species, highly visible species. These are the giant sea plumes. They're just different color. That's all. And so today is about coming out and bugging the internet for a few hours in the sense of that's all we can do to and we can just all we're doing is we're just bugging them and we're helping people come to terms and understand it and being able to absorb it and digest it and then utilizing that to live their life better but the system is so malicious and so vicious we can't change anything because people are incapable of doing the right thing. They're only incapable of doing what they're told by the media. And that's uh, the way to disappear from the planet. These, a lot of these would have died by now. That was 2015 into the fall. Uh, five expeditions on the coastline. Just unbelievable amount of underwater footage. This happens to be one of the few times where we actually got life so that's why we're showing that today because that's it's important to see there's still life hanging on when you can and you can compare it to what's supposed to be there and you can compare it to what's there right that way this is a short 44 second maybe Oh yeah, look at it. Nothing on the shore on a kelp weed. And this is in the same spot. Banks Island, the west coast. Banks Island is a 50 mile. I'm trying to get those fish again. I cleaned off the lens. That's awesome. I remember that now. But there's not much else on those rocks. That doesn't necessarily mean anything, but in this case, it does. In this case, it means a lot. In this case, it tells an interesting story. Let's go keep moving along here. We'll come back over and we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about Fukushima... This is Dolomite. We'll come back to that in a second. We'll come back over here in a minute. I just imported that. We'll jump over. I'm pretty rough. Uh, this is from Dolomite Narrows. Dolomite Narrows. I don't know how I ended up down there, but I am. Okay, let's jump over. Let's talk about Fukushima again. Coming up. <laughs> Anytime you're ready, Dana. Okay, here we go. So the jet streams 
come over in short periods. It can bring an incredible amount. Airborne plumes cause significant disposition. Significant disposition. Around 13% is what they, in the atmosphere is deposited over the U.S. and Canada. Now that will all run back down to the shoreline. Comes in, hits your continent. Comes in and hits your continent. Everything on the west side of the Rocky Mountains washes back down to the Pacific. There we go, lost our video, audio again. Whatever, let's keep going. Plutonium particles are highly mobile. Uh, Florida rain had third most, 134 got a two year half life, so it's easy to identify it. 132, 131 iodine uh, meant the chain reaction was ongoing at that point within eight days of it. Because that's what its lifespan is. So if you got iodine-131, it's just a tracer. It means all the other nasties are there, but... As uh, we, we know from the testing of salt water, how the sulfur peroxide causes this highly radioactive uh, buckyball phenomenon. It was well known back then. And they were trying to put a test ban treaty on it because of that was one of the biggest things. Because it produces the sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyball from the sodium. And the sodium, uh, you couldn't, this stuff wasn't, didn't decay like a normal isotope that was these killer isotopes pre-Fukushima. But it contained the holes and on board. It destroyed those ships permanently. And they say only pigs and rats were used, but they had soldiers. The soldiers were the test subjects, not the pigs or the rats. The pigs and rats were there to get the soldiers to go into those environments. The real test was on the soldiers. And so the animals languished and recovers or dies a painless death. No, they didn't. They suffers. Suffering was just like incredible and clearly not true that they didn't suffer but that was what they told everybody oh no they're they were euthanized they didn't suffer any pain they've killed millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of animals gave them cancers and watched them die in the laboratories for 70 years and told you it's like a banana and a potato chip walking in the sunshine and getting on a fucking airplane for the same period your friends, your families, your loved ones who work in the industry mock you every time they say that to you. They're calling you an idiot. That's what they're doing to you. They showed through photography material that the fallout, intense fallout, was do documented in New York. Game over for New York. So it's like we live in this incredible fit fable this credible idiotic fable and we know from new york to nevada is easy to work out how far that is 2237 miles took me what it's only two minutes or something to go figure it out in the first six days after baker 4900 men went into highly radioactive uh, areas for a handful of corporations So their families, their children had to do it out so a handful of corporations can laugh about it today that are still in business, still doing it to your children and, and your friends and your families in this entire planet. Still banging away at you, trying to destroy you. We increase our drinking water to accommodate them, but not tell you, not have a debate with you. Just say, shut your pie hole, we're doing it. We're the government. We're big shots. 
We don't care about you or anybody else. We do what we want. Corporation says it, we'll kill you. We don't care. We're corporation. We made a dollar. We're special. We use sophisticated software to fuck you over. We come after you with all kinds of public relation firms and infiltrate your organization or your movement and destroy you from the inside. They got people all over the world working to come after you right now. Dana, they even smeared me at CBC, the biggest media in Canada. The Globe and Mail smeared me. The Japan Times smeared me. Two different fucking times. And I didn't do nothing wrong. I'm not a bad person. Radiation cloud lingered over Florida in the eastern Gulf. But if you show this model where they got stupid high numbers. Oh, Dana, that's not true, Dana. No, well, the chart's true. The numbers are wrong. Or who knows? They Maybe they're right. There was a lot of people that died, man. Right after Fukushima. Birth defects, death in the west coast. 60% statewide. But hey, you know, Dana's not scripted or anything. He doesn't know anything. None of that is true. He photoshopped it all. He doesn't provide any evidence. Well, even if I did not provide any evidence, the ones that are out there, legitimate, alleged, legitimate mainstream sources, they provide zero evidence. That a banana or a potato chip or walking in sunshine got anything to do with a chain reaction. Yet you don't call them on that. You criticize me because I talk about it because I'm not saying it's like a banana. I'm a bad person for saying it's not like walking in the sunshine. I'm the little devil for saying it's not like getting on an airplane. For not lying, I'm the bad person. Them good, liar good, Dana bad. I hope your children watch my video and ask you the same question. Mommy, daddy, brother, sister, why did you lie about Dana for? You know it wasn't true. You know a banana wasn't like a man-made radiation. Why'd you put it in the media, in your article for? Why did you tell people it was like that? They're going to get them questions. They got nowhere to go. It's, oh, Dana's a lawyer. You can watch it at the government's website. You can watch the radioactive fallout model after just a couple of isotopes from a couple of from what they call vented, but the buildings actually blew up. The buildings blew up completely. So the actual numbers that should be there are nowhere near it. And it's shocking that we live in that environment where anybody who shows you this is called a lawyer. Even the people that created. They're calling me, oh, Dana, that's not true, but you created it. No, Dana, it's not true. <laughs> no one to defend you. Model after model of the actual radiation releases coming out of Japan, covering the entire Pacific Ocean. Wait for it. For the Norwegian Institute of um, Air Research, Shows you a model and I'm the lawyer because I showed it to you and said, hey, that's from the Norwegian Institute. You're a liar, Dana, you liar, you sack of shit. But, 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 Dana, you're a liar. And if they show the same model, it's like, oh, thank you so much for showing us the model. What does it mean? How many bananas is the word? Uh, how, what's it like in a lifetime doses of bananas, Dana? Someone says that to you. That's not an accident, right? That's someone on the other end of the keyboards, like Rod Adams, giggling, laughing, saying, let's fuck over everybody there. And if anybody buys into it, they'll fight alongside of them for a week straight. Like we, we are, we're dealing with demons, true demons. Just fucking Noah's model. Not true, Dana. But that's Noah's model of the fallout from Japan. So everybody's sucking it in in North America. It's not true, Dana. It's a lie, Dana. There's only one isotope. It's just cesium, which is just a tracer. You got any idea how many other fucking isotopes are, isotopes are actually in the models? <laughs> Jesus. This model is only based on 40 days. Do you think it stopped fucking coming out of there after 40 days? 
There's another model? Doesn't mean nothing. So the whole Pacific Ocean, let's move it ahead. The whole Pacific Ocean within a week is covered. So it all falls down through the Pacific Ocean all the way to the ocean floor. Right? You know, if... Have you got a... Like, if, if I throw shit at you, or say, if I aerosol shit, and your whole community got a layer of shit, 50 feet high, air layer, aerosol shit layer, you can't go anywhere for the whole week. You got to drive, wipe it off your windshield all day long. All that do. It looks like do, but it's actually shit. So it's not like do, it's like dirty do. Right? And you're breathing in that shit, right? That aerosol shit. That's no different than what you're looking at here. That's exactly what's happening. Except it happened to your whole country. And you only got to breathe one of them for 10, 20, 30 years to get a cancer. To get an illness, an autoimmune deficiency, one of the 1800s to show up for cancer. Cancer doesn't show up for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. But Alzheimer's and dementia and autism, oh yeah, baby, shows up long before cancer. Cancer is the last one that shows up. So leaving Japan is hitting North America, boom. It's just boom, boom. Right? Even the university, boy, the university on TV. No, it's not true, Dana. No one ever come into my whole home. They never told me on CBC, Dana. Yeah, they did. Originally, they, they were looking for street creds. I don't smoke cigarettes no more, but I'm smoking something else to study. <laughs> not cigarettes. So the tsunami wiped out the country. Wiped it out, 400 kilometers of it, and all the people in the red died. The yellow are missing because of the stuff to your left. That stuff is the left. Everything detonated. That's unit one. Unit two allegedly was why they evacuated, not unit three. No, not unit three for some reason. That's not why they evacuated it. No, 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 no. Not unit four. No, unit two. Shut up. Right, this is the cover story right away. You know, a four total meltdown, completely gone. And you bring in a stupid red truck and pretend that that pool is is uh, 140 feet up in the air. It's a 190 foot high building, 60 feet extra under the ground. All together, the building is 250 feet. And then it's 150 feet wide. It's a very big, big building. Makes that transport truck look like a dinky, yeah? But everything is gone. So there is no fuel pulled. That was just to keep you from understanding the truth. Your media worldwide come out and show you the beautiful picture behind me. When in reality, it looked like the one I put up over there with the number four above it. Look at it from this angle. The pictures behind me are the ones I put there. But here's CBC showing you a fake fuel pull inside the buildings behind me. But Dana's the bad person, yeah? And you're a fucking idiot if you believe these people and you don't want to hold them accountable for what they got done to this planet. If you think it's okay to come out and lie to you like they got done here. This is TEPCO showing you beautiful fuel pools, but look at the buildings behind me and the detonations. Right? Why is TEPCO showing you a beautiful fuel pool with people inside of it when no one can get inside of the building over there? So ask yourself that question. Because that's TEPCO's official webs picture how is you get this with that guy down here in the building in a building you can't get into saying these are both the same building and that the fuel removal from you in for fukushima is finished saying that 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 building is inside of that when you know fucking well that is ludicrous and then the media come out and pirated it and you can't have a conversation motherboard done it to you Physics.org, done it to you. Even Nuclear Engineering International. Even Seth Dorn from CBS, PBS, done it to you. He's claiming he's inside of a building on top of that building that don't exist. It used to look like that behind me. When Seth is in there, it's all gone. That truck was a fable, right? That was meant to fuck you over. The truck is not in that shot, see? To the left, is it? <laughs> right? It's not in the one to the left, is it? 
You know why? Because that was the fable. Right? There's no pool. See? You get it yet? You get what your friends and your families and your, your friends and your loved ones and people work in nuclear power plant and public relations firms done to everybody. They killed us all so they can have a paycheck for a couple of years. They fucked everybody and everything on this planet so they can have a paycheck. That's not dis disgusting. A tsunami ran through the country, ran through that friggin' country. Nuclear is the most dangerous thing, period. This is why we got terrorist laws. This is why we got nuclear waste holding sites. And when you see a forecast saying you got radioactive fallout from a credible institution, and then the Discovery Channel runs out with this absolute retarded moron who done it on purpose, who does this on purpose, to pretend that you're an idiot if you thought that was fallout because that was tsunami, but at the same time not bother telling you that there's actual fallout charts. The utter betrayal of Discovery Channel. It really is striking when 20 million particles of radioactive iodine 131 per liter fell on the U.S. during post-Fukushima peak. So we wash back down to the coastline and then we go out and we do these expeditions on the coastline. And I'm adverse conditions like people can't even conceive. And th thick or thin, we went out there and we pulled it off. We don't know how we made it back, but we did. We took our time and done methodically on the whole coastline of North America. We never avoided anything. We went into the strangest friggin' places, in the hell. We literally went to hell. Like Bag Harbor. I went through hell in that place. That was hellish 80, 90 mile an hour winds. You had nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. It was shit weather on those beaches. It was shit weather on those beaches. Let's find where I screwed up to that time. So we went in there, anchored up, went to work on Dolomite, which is a very famous place in British Columbia, Canada. A lot of barnacles. That beach is all barnacles. These were one of the rare spots. Is raining, miserable. But you got to get out there at low tide and do your job. And that's your job. You got to find out what's going on. Get in there and do a species count, right? Handful of species. And we popped a zodiac. And shortly after this, punched a hole into it. Wind picked up. And my buddy, Zoe. Every once in a while, you find a dead crab, baby crab. I'll take a few pictures. But that would be about the only life you would find on the beach would be that dead crab. And here we found barnacles, full size, which was really unusual. But normally you would find at 80% of the coastline, no matter where you were to. And they're really dangerous to barnacles because you rip your parts of zodiac, right? I didn't have to worry about them for 99.9% .9 of the coastline. That was extraordinary. And so... What's the point I'm trying to make? I, I hid away and got some of these pictures out. This is um, in the Queen Charlotte's formerly known, or uh, Haida Gwaii, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte's. We've been out there for months. Zoe's pretty seasoned at this stage. She doesn't care about the bad weather. And I should be able to zoom in. That's a great shot. And there's a handful of species here, but there should be uh, 5,600 highly visible species. But this was one of those weird spots. And so those barnacles, those big full-size barnacles, they will rip your friggin' boat apart. And as the tide went down, it became a very dangerous spot. So I'm out there working in that. For most part, that's what the weather I was dealing with. And so you get a lot of bad pictures, yeah? 
There's a starfish right in the center of the picture and long. But you can see I got a hole in the zodiac. The zodiac's deflated. And Zoe's like, okay, Dana's upset. So it must be going home time. I pull the zodiac in and uh, Zoe, she died last year out doing a bird count out here. And bless her heart. So hard. But so good to see those pictures, I guess. is a better way to say it. So now I'm in trouble. We got good winds. I'm tucked away there. But I got a big hole in the Zodiac. It's filled up with water. <laughs> Not cool. And so that almost got me killed that night. I flipped it over that night because I had to use the Zodiac to try to go get my anchors in all those hurricane weather. Went through a lot of gloves. Those are fairly expensive. And so you would rip them open and you just... The point was to wear them to keep your hands dry, right? It's just everything was expensive no matter what you tried to do and everybody knows that. So you had quite a few little tiny uh, snails right here. And you can see the limpets. Normally the limpets are everywhere. They like to eat algae. Just usually 700 algae, you'll find limpets galore, but there wasn't. You see how bad the weather is here? That narrow is a really dangerous, very dangerous spot. You gotta wait for a high tide to get through it. But it stops you from having to go out into the Hackett straight. So you're coming in the back door. But it's also very, supposed to be one of the most coveted places um, in North America. And when you're shorter, you would expect to see uh, this wide di diversity like be to the left. You would expect all of that to your left everywhere you look in there or to the right on that particular one. But to the left, you would expect this incredible diversity. And once again, Haida Gwaii uh, is the very out to the left, very far out. Uh, oh, let me get that sorted out. I get it. Sometimes. Not today, though, eh? And, uh... That picture is up right coming from the very bottom. See Rose Harbor? It's one up above that. The arrow above Rose Harbor on way on the outside there. Yeah, that's where that's coming from. Okay, let's keep rolling, 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 rolling. Oh, make sure I can zoom. Okay. Lone Seagull checking me out. He's a buddy. And you got a couple of algaes, mostly kelp weed, which is the most popular weed for the Pacific. Once again, 700 highly visible species are missing. This was a nice clean close up. And that's a sea anemone, baby sea anemones, I think, right there. Is that what that was about? Back to the gold for some reason. Okay, and so I got no idea what this is. This is Dolomite. I'm gonna play it. I don't know what it is though. Oh yeah, right. Let's play it. a minute more. We'll just let it play go.
Best to run down there. I'm headed down to that spot where we're just looking at. I'll turn the music down because I don't know what I'm doing half the time. So I'm running down to Burnaby. Uh, from that other spot we were just looking at. It's a tough run, tough coastline, that whole coastline. So I'm running across that gap there where I'm exposed. So pouring fucking rain, just pouring rain, headed off. Right, because low tide doesn't wait, it doesn't care, you know? So we're heading over to the Narrows. Poor Zoe. She doesn't care. She don't give a fuck. It's a hard case, man. She lose her mind. It was sometimes she would get off the boat, but so we we stopped the audio. We popped the mo. Uh, we're talking about that. Oh well. We popped a hole in the pontoon. Make our way back to the boat. I guess so, we can call it a day, what you can do, it's a good hole, lost all year in a few moments, so. Yeah. What are you doing? Hey, let's go with me, you coming with me? You can't jump that way, foolish. No. Now where are you going? Huh? What are you going to do over there? You're going to get into trouble. Keep going, you got to do something. You coming with Dana? Where are you going? <laughs> Zoe, just bust it. Oh man, dude. Let's go with Dana. Come on. What are you doing now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> are you coming with Dana? Come on, man. Let's go. Stop fooling around. Let's go. She's, She's just so getting dainty, lazy. Eh? Just watch the way she walks. Oh, yeah. She never oh, moves her feet more than two inches at a beach. time. She makes 60 steps to go the five feet. Tune deflated all the energy out of you, did it? <laughs> Don't feel bad. <laughs> that was a rough go on us all that day. And then we ended up getting the shit kicked out of us that night. Washed up on the rocks, flipped over that little zodiac, and ended up ended up in a real bad place. Had to run in to Queen Charlotte City. Oh fuck, man! Destroyed props. What a miserable, what a miserable fucking nightmare that was. But we knew that twenty million particles fell out of the sky. We weren't willing to pretend, so we went and looked. Now, there was 10 times more iodine-132 and 30 times more iodine-133 for every iodine-131 that's created. And iodine-132 and 133 ionize and radiate your thyroid glands nine times more effective than iodine-131, all right? I'm only telling you 500 more times. All yeah, right, that's much better. Don't look at the lights. If I look at the lights, I can't see the screens anymore. I'll take a second. CCM-137 forecast shows high altitude radiation cloud concentrating over the United States and California. California, I... I don't know, I probably lost ability. Hang on. I put the trigger to sleep, so. Oh, yeah. That's done. Oh, Jesus. Let's keep going. Uh, so, it looks like that. So, the forecast shows the whole ocean contaminated within just a couple of days. And uh, North America, Europe... 
It's just from Francis I R S N. And NILU got so much pressure to end it. That was their last forecast. Showing iodine 131. With the reactors running uranium, plutonium. And they got uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, previous unpublished maps. So the Canadian government already knew. They fucking hid it away. We know who done it too, don't we? Fukushima will start burning radioactive waste, 100,000 becquels a kilogram. This is completely out of control. This is completely 100% a remorseless crazies to do anything like that. That's like literally, this is insanity. 300 times more radiation, and now they're going to burn it around the clock. But what? How did these people get, you know, they're going to burn, destroy the country? They got 30 million bags they picked up on top of that. Right on top of that. They picked it up because it's man-made radiation, not because it's like a bananas. Or not because it's like walking in the sunshine or getting on an airplane. Or pizza or whatever. And I was going to try to import another set. Or maybe I will. Hang on. I don't know, man. I'm looking for the trip back. So Seattle. He found all the isotopes right away. And, and here's Health Canada telling you to shut your fucking pie hole if you're worried about it. Really? That takes balls, man. Let me keep going. So, here we go. That's where I got lost. Probably double or triple, but just 10 times more 132, 30 times more 133. And we know there was a lot. This is not iodine they're picking up. They're picking it up because it's uranium, plutonium, and americium, and neptunium, and strontium, and technetium, and all their daughter products. These are all man-made. That stuff at 1400 baseline, um, which is really high numbers, the, f the baseline, not the f and the 14 is like a 1400 above. And so the EPA claiming no radiation could reach North America is the stupidest thing imaginable, right? Utter betrayal. They actually abandoned the radiation monitoring and shut it down, right? They won't conduct any more radiation testing. I don't expect an update. That was Boise, California. Uh, only one left is broken. I mean, they had 150... And something like 99 was broken, so they turned it all off or backwards. 50 was broken, they turned them all off. It was found in the food supply. Even if they just admit to finding trace, they found trace of one, then you're going to find traces of all the other isotopes, and you only need one in your body to liquidate your assets in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Schools are closing in Korea, but they wouldn't even admit it happened in North America and still won't because they know their families will hang them. They know their friends will hang them. They know the, the, the country wants to hang them when they find out what they got done. They know they should be hung for what they're doing to you, what they've done to you, the lies they told you. They, know, they, they, they will be dealt with. This planet is going to light up the longer we wait, the more angry or the world will be when it wakes up. You can't hide the death of the Pacific Ocean. You can't hide the mass species die-offs, right? You can't hide uh, the Tokyo soil so hot it should be sent off. 30 million tons of hot stuff smoking. 30 million tons. They got 30 million one-ton bags on top of that picked up. Cracks in the building. 20 million yen to censor people like me. And there's not many. So they go overboard with it. That's why you don't see me with any views. That's why you see my subscription stuck for the last two years in the same 
the zone where it doesn't do anything. Back and forth, five or ten subscribers and just sits there year after year for three years. It's idiotic to think that people don't, the biggest subject on the planet, no one cares about it. Video, Japan burning Fukushima debris. But if I make a video about bananas, potato chips, and say it's like that, I'll get four million views right away. But it's all from cunt sites, gross, disgusting, excuse the name. What I meant to call them was scum PR firm sites. Excuse me. Please get rough, beat up people for complaining about terrorist bombs in their community. Like, if you done that over here in Canada, we'd fucking hang you right in the street for it. Canada wouldn't sit there and let you get away with it after an accident. Japanese? No. They went out and fought for it and the police beat them up. And then the police went down there and sucked up that radiation and then got deformed and sick children. And But their children will have deformed children if it doesn't happen right away, but they'll get it down the road. The dust monitoring and fallout investigations are evidently... Fake. Fake. Radiation dose in Northeast and Great Lakes in North America was equal to the West Coast. But the people that are out there destroying me, attacking me, using sophisticated software to silence me and my research, uh, like, how can you ever live with yourself? What kind of fucking degenerate scumbag would destroy me? Chernobyl, 1.5 million. But Chernobyl... Chernobyl was a 30% meltdown. But they stole people off the streets. When the robots broke down because of the extreme radioactivity men were sent in to clean up the site. They were not volunteers. They were picked up off the streets and press ganged onto the roof. Right. They took people off the street and put them on the roof. It's not the 5,000 nuke plant workers or the 50,000 throughout the country, no. No, they went and got strangers. They never said, what do you do for a living? They never said, are you in busy or are you... Are you ill, or are you healthy, or underage, or are you illiterate, or anything? They just stole them, brought them in, and threw them on the roof. Then they got graveyards. And Chernobyl was one third the size of any of the reactors in Japan. Chernobyl was a thirty percent meltdown. Chernobyl stopped after ten days. Chernobyl hell on earth. Videl wrote the third sentence from the top. Every 10 days, it stopped after 10 days, allegedly. We don't believe that, of course, but they, they said the animosity equivalent of 400 Hiroshima bombs. But Japan didn't stop. And Japan's equal to millions and millions of Hiroshima bombs. And we've detonated less than a thousand of these types of bombs on the planet throughout history. And just this one facility has produced millions and it might never stop. And the whole planet is radiated already and the death of the Pacific Ocean is well on their way. And CNN says Fukushima only 7% bad as Chernobyl, but Fukushima was three 100% meltdowns. Plus they had five reactor cores high in the building that are now melted down and gone. This is thousands of Chernobyls. CNN shouldn't exist. CNN, why does CNN, CNN even exist? 3% of the children exposed to uh, Chernobyl were healthy. 3 million children. Like if you got treated because of radioactive contamination, you'll be treated for the rest of your life. And if you didn't, you should have been. If they can identify what... Because you're talking about heart and liver and respiratory, pituitary, adrenaline glands, Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, diabetes. It's an unbelievable list. This is the ones they know about. We know that from the dog studies, the animal studies. 
Each reactor building, I think, holds 3,450 spent fuel assemblies, not each reactor. And that's 5 million pounds. And then that would mean there's 30 million pounds on the roof of each reactor building. I'm not sure if that's realistic or not. It probably is. Um, but so hard to get the truth when everybody lies all the time. And these were the numbers we were using, but now we don't know if they're true or not. We do know uh, at least 5 million, which is 3,450, you're talking 80 rods, each rod is 18 pounds, you're talking 5 million pounds per cycle. I, I, I think that's not what's going on. I think that's the inventory for 10 years, which is six reactor cores. But I could be wrong. I hope I'm... I am hope I'm right, and that's the entire inventory. I hope it's not 30 million pounds per building, because that fucking is frightening beyond imagination. Let's get back to Fukushima. Oh, Fukushima. I hardly knew ya. Now you blew up and caught fire and blew up and caught fire and blew up. And don't look like that. So why are they saying that? Why ain't you stopping them? Why ain't you using your voice? Why ain't you asking tough questions? Because they tricked you and deceived you, manipulated you, misrepresented everything and vilified and demonized and attacked people like me for daring saying, hey, wait a second. That came in there, wiped out 400 kilometers of the coastline. And all those people in the red died because that came through their fucking city. And that came through their 400 kilometers of the coastline, which is the same spot where there's 15 reactors, so it might be more than Fukushima. And, like, they won't even admit there's radioactive fallout, but we got headline after headline, documentation after documentation, showing hot particles found 400 kilometers. Because 400 kilometers of coastline looked like that. So how are you going to get power there anywhere if there's a repository here or a nuclear holding site or anything else? Huh? Came clear where radiation came further south in Tokyo, which is 14 prefectures, should be wrote off. A shocking. Your whole country's fucked. And rather than deal with it, they're going to pretend it didn't happen. And then attack anybody that says different because there's not very many of them. So it's easy to kill and get rid of and destroy and victimize and isolate that than it is to tell the truth. So we made a three hour stream, did we? That's pretty good. <laughs> three hours is pretty good. That tells the story. You know, 5,000 nuclear plant workers or dead people walking, but you'll hear them say, no one died from radiation over and over and over. They all will, every one of them. But it could be 10, 20 years down the road. Not likely. These guys got big doses. And it's not from ingesting the radiation so much as it's from the gamma shine, the x-rays, and the neutron bursts that these people would have been exposed to. It is what it is. Well, we got to deal with it. We got to talk about it. We got to stop lying about it. We can't hide away from it. Three billion people are dependent upon it. You can make up all the shit you want, but this is going to come back and bite every one of you people on the ass that's doing it and in very short order. Six years, like nobody, including the PR firms, expected this nightmare. But that is what we're, that is the cards we're dealt with. And rather than try to escape it we need to uh, we need to face up to it we need to appreciate it really is an extinction event I really did go out and do that whole coastline and we really do show that this is very very grave and has to be addressed and that we have to change our ways that war is no longer tenable that the, the one party, two party system keeping everybody divided 
and distracted while we wait for the inevitable end of some idiot pushing the nuclear button and finishing it all off, that we should pause and think and say, hey, maybe, you know, we don't need to kill everybody on this planet. Maybe we should just stop the handful of people that are orchestrating this up against us. The, the, the oligarchs or the nuclear elites, you know, people who have made billions and hundreds of millions off nuclear don't want to give it up. And they will kill me and you and everybody else to keep that illusion alive so their family won't look at them with the contempt that they deserve. And they deserve every bit of contempt coming their way. And it is coming their way. No silver, no Bitcoin. Sorry, Nick O'Brien. And we ran out of money a long time ago. We raised a couple of hundred last week, which is awesome. Thank you, Veronica, by the way, if you're listening. I know you don't watch all of this stuff, but... Uh, we need to raise another 150. We need to have a money bomb coming up at some point because I'm going to have to raise money to pay for, you know, they got to pay for that website coming up in March. But I also, we got to get equipment to go out and do this expedition coming up this spring, the final uh, terrifying expedition. We're going to live stream this coastline. We have most of the equipment already. We're very seasoned, very qualified. And probably ready to go do what needs to be done. If we don't, nobody else will do it. You can donate below the video. You can go over to the nuclear proctologist and you can donate with your credit cards, dear, if you're interested. Anybody gives a fuck? I do. I can't do anything. Like the boat's empty. We got to fill up the boat. That's hundreds of dollars. And it's just so hard to keep asking people to support me when I know that most people just don't give a fuck and the ones that do they're just worn out And but I don't want to be worn out I don't want to give up I don't want to stop and I can keep going if I had the help and probably without the help but <laughs> it's a lot easier if everybody helps and you're so worn out for always begging and asking it's just hard Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Radico. And Jace. And Home Goddess. Hello, everybody. Amthers. Welcome. And hugs. We're out of here. That's the stream today. Cotton. Ellie. M. Racy. Elaine, of course, who hasn't stopped. Poor thing. Worn out like everybody else. Hugs for everybody. You see Kate's up there? Yeah. Hugs for Kate. And everybody. We do what we do. And we do the best we can do. And we're good at it. And we're proud to do that much. That's what we do. We do what we can as often as we can and sometimes we get worn out and sometimes we get burnt out and sometimes we get shouted out and shouted down if you're like me you might even get arrested and attacked and vilified and smeared but you get up the next day and brush it off your shoulder and you get back out there and you take one for the team that's the game you gotta keep playing it or they win Hugs for everybody. We'll see everybody Monday. Take care, folks.